Her neighbors would hear blood-curdling screams coming from the parking lot. What they didn't realize was that they were listening to her being abducted. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Julie Buskin. Viewer discretion is advised. Jewel Jean Buskin, who would actually go by Julie to everyone. She was born on October 24th, 1975, and she was raised in Benton, Arkansas. She graduated from Benton High School there in Arkansas in 1993, and she had dreams and aspirations of one day becoming a professional dancer, in particular a ballerina. She would end up attending the Oklahoma College of Fine Arts and was a member of the Oklahoma University Dance School. And Julie was an absolutely fantastic dancer. She caught on to it really quickly. She was graceful. She was beautiful. She loved to put her blood, sweat, and tears into this. She loved to practice every single day. One of her proudest moments was performing in the show Swan Lake. And not only did she get along with every single person that she danced with, she also had a humongous group of friends outside of all of that. She got along with everybody. She was really well-liked. She was extremely popular. So in the winter of 1996, Julie had graduated from the dance school. And since she had done that, she was going to be moving back home to, with her family in Arkansas. And then the plan there was to enroll in graduate school. And she wanted to earn her teaching degree because her, her ultimate goal was to open up her own dance studio and teach children how to dance. She wanted to teach ballet. And so her parents were had already arranged to pick up a U-Haul and drive from Arkansas to her apartment there in Oklahoma, pack up all of her things, and bring her home. And on December 20th, 1996, that's exactly what they did. But when her parents arrived, they found out something quite alarming. Their daughter Julie was now missing. She was not in her apartment. What they learned was that she was last seen by her friends on the night of December 19th, 1996. Julie had hung out with some friends and then she was going to drop one of her friends off at the Will Rogers Airport, which she did. She was definitely observed doing it. Her friend could confirm she dropped her off. And that was the last time anyone actually saw Julie, any one of her friends or family ever again. And then at about 5.30 a.m., now on December 20th, the morning of December 20th, there would be uh, 911 calls, a couple calls made to police with regards to the sounds of someone screaming in the parking lot. 911, yes, we were just sleeping, and my wife heard a really strange, like a really awful scream from our parking lot of our apartment complex. Do you see anything outside? No, I'm kind of afraid to go outside, actually. They also happened to have an off-duty police officer who doubled as a security guard at that apartment complex that Julie lived in, uh, and he was informed about these screams. He went to check out where the screams are coming from, but he didn't see anything. He didn't hear anything. One witness said not only did they hear the sound of a woman screaming, but they also heard a man screaming, shut up and get in the car. And then another witness heard a car speeding out of the parking lot. Now, later that afternoon, a close friend of Julie's would go to her apartment to check on her to see if, you know, she was ready for her to do something that they were going to be doing, and she didn't answer the door. He also noticed that her car was missing from its normal parking spot there. So he just kind of assumed that, you know, she was out doing something, but she would be home soon. So he tries again later, and still she's not answering her door, and her car is still not there. And so the friend would reach out to other friends and I think some of Julie's family members who may have been nearby and none of them had seen her, none of them had heard from her. So at that point, they report her missing. And it just so happens to be later on that evening when Julie's parents arrive in Oklahoma with the U-Haul when they find out that their daughter is missing. Then they found out about this sound of a female screaming in the parking lot and a car speeding away and a man saying to shut up and get in the car. And now Julie's car is missing as well as Julie. Coinciding with all of that, right around, I think it's the same day, or maybe the next day, there is a man who is driving past, I guess, Lake Stanley Draper, and he sees what looks like someone lying on the ground on the bank of the river. 
and he doesn't really think much of it. Then he goes home, but he, it's been bothering him, and he says, you know what, I gotta go back and see what that was. He goes back with his wife, and they get closer to the person they saw lying on the ground, and that person is still there. And at that point, they realized this person is dead, and it was the body of a female. When police arrive, they you know get a good look at the victim. She had been shot to death. She was lying on her stomach. Her hands were bound behind her back. She was fully clothed. However, her jeans were unbuttoned and unzipped. And I guess her underwear had been somewhat rolled down um, a little bit. And then with the missing persons report being filed about Julie and then them finding this body pretty much coinciding together, they were able to very quickly determine that this was in fact the body of Julie Buskin. Julie was just 21 years old. The coroner determined that Julie had been shot execution style in the back of her head. She had, the gun had been pressed directly against her skin. That's how close it was when it was fired. They also determined that Julie had been sexually assaulted and lying a few feet away from where her body was, was a pink leotard. And that pink leotard was later determined to belong to Julie. On that leotard was uh, seminal fluid, male bodily fluid. The police also found several footprints, uh, shoe impressions, in the red sand near her body. And they, her shoes were still on, and they determined that some of the shoe impressions were from her, but there were other shoe impressions, which were a size 9, uh, a men's size 9, were found that were obviously not matching her shoe impression. So they believed that those shoe impressions came from her killer. And they would determine that the shoe impressions were made by a size 9 Nike shoe. Specifically, the Nike Air 2s. The following day, Julie's vehicle was actually found. And it was in the parking lot, not of her apartment complex, but in an apartment complex across the street. The vehicle, a red Summit Eagle, was completely intact. There was no broken windows. There was no forced entry in the vehicle. They, they dusted the entire car for fingerprints. They actually found none. There was no blood in the car, no hair samples. There was really no forensic evidence other than a little tiny amount of red sand, which they would later discover was the exact same red sand found with, or, you know, where she was, where her body was found. Inside the car, no sign of a struggle, nothing appeared to be stolen. So they really didn't get a lot of forensic evidence from it other than that sand. Two things were missing from Julie. Her cell phone was missing and her ring that she always wore was missing. Now with her cell phone being missing, they were able to find out, like look at to her phone records and a phone call was made from Julie's phone, which would have happened after she had been murdered. It was used twice. One to, I guess, call some number to check the weather forecast, but also it was used to call a number that was out of service. So that really led them nowhere at that point. The DNA that they had collected had not matched anyone specifically at that point. Detectives would interview all the people who had called 911 that night. They also had call, interviewed everyone at the apartment complex that they could. And while other people heard the screams and had called 911 when they heard it, thankfully, um, no one actually reported to really seeing anything significant in terms of like Julie like being kidnapped from her apartment or from outside of her car. They did hear a car speeding away, which they believe had to have been Julie's car at that point being driven by her kidnapper. So the, she would have been able to have gotten home from the airport by about 5.30 a.m. when those screams were heard. So what they think happened was that she had parked her car, she had gotten out, and then she was accosted by her would-be assailant. Kidnapped, thrown into her own vehicle, driven to the location where she was found, and then raped and murdered. About a month goes by when police get a tip from a man who calls in and says that on the night of Julie's murder, he saw a man driving that red vehicle away from the area of the lake where Julie's body was found. And apparently this guy got a pretty good look at the man, and he would come up with a composite drawing and... You know, this sketch here is one of the two, I think two different sketches made of who this man could, what, what he may have looked like. Uh, even after de putting that photo out there on the news and the newspapers, nobody recognized him. Then her case goes cold. And for about four and a half years, they really don't get anywhere until someone who had, I guess, been at a local jail 
came to police four and a half years after the murder. And she said that she recognized the sketch of that man from earlier matching a man she saw at this local jail. The man, his name was Dennis. He was a construction worker who lived within a couple of blocks of Julie. When police found this guy, they asked him, they asked him questions. He denied having anything to do with the murder. They, they asked him, are you willing to give your DNA? He says, no, he won't take a polygraph test. He won't do anything. He does have a resemblance to one of the sketches that was made, but eventually they were able to get a court order to get his DNA, which he then provides because he has to. And that DNA was not a match um, from the DNA found at the crime scene. So he was ruled out. Six years after Julie is murdered, another suspect comes into view. A man named Anthony Sanchez had been arrested six or so years after Julie's murder, and he was arrested for the rape of his own girlfriend. And when he was arrested and charged with rape, he had to surrender his DNA. And so police were just curious, like, you know, this might be the guy, this might be him, you know, given that he was now being arrested for rape in the same area. And so they take his DNA and they are going to try to match it up with the DNA found with Julie. That's going to take some time. But they begin to look into this guy and they discover that one of his former girlfriends kept a diary. And in that diary, she noted that um, Anthony had purchased a pair of sneakers for her. And then he himself purchased the same sneakers in a size nine and they were heir to Nike's. They did confirm that Anthony Sanchez wore a size 9, which would match the size of shoe impressions found at the crime scene. Julie had also been shot with a 22 caliber weapon, which they had uh, one of the bullets. The bullets had, I guess, some rare striations on them that wasn't super common. And looking into Anthony Sanchez, they also found out through one of his former girlfriends that he and his dad, for whatever reason, used to take 22 caliber guns and shoot them into their walls. So police get a warrant to search the home Anthony was living in. They bring in radar, they begin knocking down walls to see if they can find any bullets to see if they can match it to the ones found with Julie, but they have no luck. But then a couple of days later, I guess the landlord who is cleaning up after all of this attempt to collect evidence, he finds a small 22 caliber bullet. And so they take that bullet and they match it with the bullet found with Julie. They line it up with the microscope and it is pretty much a match. It's the same bullet or the same type of bullet fired from the same gun. And then they finally get the uh, results of the DNA test. And Anthony Sanchez, it is confirmed. It was his DNA, his seminal fluid found on that leotard found next to Julie's body. When confronted, he completely denies it. He says, I don't even know her, which is true. He didn't. Uh, they didn't know each other whatsoever. Um, but he, all he really said was, I didn't do it. You know, my DNA matches. Great. It wasn't me. Well, it's, it's difficult to refute science. <laughs> so he had a history of, of breaking and entering. He had a history of robbery, not also to go along with his history of sexual assault and rape, but he was known to be a thief and he had been arrested for it before. So what they think happened, because this was December 20th, Christmas was just a couple days away, they think he was stalking uh, apartment complex, you know, parking lots and looking inside vehicles to see if people had any Christmas presents in their cars. And he was likely doing that when Julie pulled into her parking spot when he noticed her. And then he decided right then and there, I'm going to kidnap her and I'm going to rape her and I'm going to kill her. And then he runs up to her and he tries to kidnap her. And that's when they hear the screams. Then they hear the guy saying, get in the car. And then they hear the sound of the car driving away. It all kind of lines up. They don't have the shoes anymore, however. They did never found those shoes. I don't think they ever found the gun either. But they did have the bullet evidence. They had the DNA. They had the fact, circumstantially, that he did wear the same size shoe, and there was records of him purchasing those shoes. So, he was arrested and formally charged with the murder of, of Julie. And in 2006, he goes on trial, and the evidence is pretty overwhelming. Now, I want to say, that during the trial, there was a point where he actually tried to suggest that it wasn't his DNA, it was probably his dad's DNA, I guess as a Hail Mary. They even, they can, they do a test then and determine that the DNA was not his father's. 
So he's trying to throw his own dad under the bus. Um, but at any rate, Anthony is then convicted of the murder and he's sentenced to death. In 2009, he tries to appeal the conviction and he loses. He then tries to say, as another Hail Mary before his execution date, that once again, it's his father who did it, it's his DNA. And he's saying, now he's saying, that his dad confessed to the rape and murder of Julie. And then a girlfriend of Anthony's dad also said that he confessed to it. But conveniently, they're saying this confession happened. They're not coming forward to police until after Anthony's father had killed himself. So he was dead. Then they came out and said that he confessed. Convenient. And even though they had that evidence at the trial before that they tried to match it up with his dad and it was they had no luck, they once again said, okay, we'll test the DNA again. And now the DNA testing, because this is, this is years has gone by now, that DNA testing is more advanced and they're able to 100% say it was not his father's DNA. It was Anthony's DNA, specifically, 100% his DNA. And so once again, his appeal was denied. And then in September of 2023, the then 44-year-old Anthony Sanchez is out of appeals. He has exhausted everything. He still denies that he had anything to do with it, but he is strapped to a table and he is executed by lethal injection. And this was all despite there were a lot of protesters protesting his execution, saying they're executing an innocent man. But this is a case where the DNA is is completely, it's accurate. And they're trying to say that, oh, the DNA must, must have been contaminated in some way. But they ran that test a bunch of times and it always came back to him. And it's important to note that he repeatedly denied having even met Julie. But his DNA puts him literally with her body. And so they got the correct guy. I mean, this was her killer. This was her rapist or kidnapper and her killer. This is a case where they did their homework, they did well, they investigated this, and they got the right guy. And so in the end, 21-year-old Julie Buskin got the justice she rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, please subscribe if you are new to the channel. Hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here, obviously. Um, I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. I, the link to my TikTok pages are in the link tree in the description of this video below. So feel free to check those out if you want. And then also in the description below, you will find my email address. If there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a quick recommendation to my email and just send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened, I'll add it to the list. The list is close to 6,400 names long. I pick the cases I cover each time at random. I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will cover it eventually at some point, either here on YouTube or on TikTok. It just depends. But that is it for this video. And so until the next case, ta-ta for now. True crime, Arunij. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.